Please be seated. And good morning. It's good to be with you. It's good for us to be together. Will you please pray with me? O oh Lord, as you build up your kingdom of heaven on earth, please continue to give us a wild courage to trust you as the master carpenter. Amen. This gospel text from Mark today is a retelling of Herod's order to take the innocent life of John the Baptist. Herod likes John well enough, but there are a couple of problems. First, Herodias is looking to get back at John for telling the truth about her relationship with Herod. And secondly, Herod feels he has to save face and do what his birthday dinner guests are expecting of him, keeping his word. It is Herod's compromised backbone that leads to John's death. John the Baptist has the risky business of truth-telling, which was not too popular in Herod's court. John's life and witness pointed to God, and truly it was John who showed the most backbone. Herod's life pointed to his dysfunctional use of power and the triangulation between Herod, Herodias, and John. God's power is such that even with John's death, even with John's death, there is a building up of the kingdom. Herod's attempt to save face is at the cost of considering what God wants, perpetuating a pattern of oppression and destruction. When we are preoccupied with ourselves or with pleasing others, then we miss the mark of what God wants from us. When we abdicate responsibility and depend on others to make our decisions, to direct our actions, or to validate us, then the outcome can become a mistake. 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas referred to this confusion of wants and needs and off-centered priorities as inordinate desires. In other words, whenever we hope for something to happen that is not aligned with God's purposes, we have inordinate desires. It's very human. Becca Ehrlich talks about this also in her book, Christian Minimalism. When we think our wants and are the same thing as our needs, then we become confused. Our current society suffers from a similar syndrome referred to as compare and despair. Compare and despair is what you experience when you look at people's online posts with their amazing trips, their outstanding accomplishments, and life-changing makeovers. We can begin to feel envious and then a little depressed, right? Because Instagram or Pinterest has just sucked us into the black hole of wanting things and doing things for the sake of impressing others. Did you know that there are companies that will superimpose, Photoshop your face onto the perfect body at the perfect beach to show you had the perfect vacation? I wonder what my face would look like on Brad Pitt's body. <laughs> oh, how Herod and Herodias would have loved gratuitously posting on social media, and then perhaps a TV show, Keeping Up with the Herodashians. <laughs> Inordinate desires. It's not really Pinterest or Instagram, is it? It's us. But there has been a movement, at least over the last two to 3,000 years, a movement of faith to measure justice in this world and how we treat one another by the law of righteousness. This law of righteousness is the calling card of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, and as it is sometimes known. The New Testament is God's rule in Jesus as the new covenant, the law of love incarnate. And as Christians, we are that movement of such a love as law in action, love in action. 
In 750 BCE, Amos, the prophet Amos, was responsible for waking up the movement of God's people who had gone AWOL. Amos was not a priest or a trained theologian. He refers to himself simply as a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. But what God sees is the holy, and God sees in Amos a can-do prophet. And by the way, in the Middle East and parts of Africa, sycamore trees produced a little fig-like fruit. It was covered in a thick hull or husk. And the dresser of sycamore trees' job was to pierce the husk of each little fig so that it could ripen. And this was labor-intensive because each fig only had a little bit of fruit in it, which is why only the poor would have even bothered with it. This prophet Amos, the dresser of impossible fruit, was whom God chose to prophesy to God's hard-shelled people. I can hear God almost. Amos pierced the thick people of Israel with my word so that they will ripen and mature. And it's not just for their sake. Tell them that they are, after all, supposed to be a light to the nations. God wants God's people to focus on things that have kingdom purposes. But God's people, we, have a propensity for messing up again and again. Amos has to tell them the God's honest truth, so to speak, which is meant to help them. The God's honest truth is supposed to set them free. That's God's intention. So that's when Amos has his dream, his holy vision about God standing with a plumb line next to a wall. I went to a store this week and bought a plumb line. Sometimes it's called a a plumb bob. It's just a weight on the end of a string, and I put it on this pencil. But it's to measure just an ancient tool, and it's just to measure the vertical straightness of anything. Let me see this this pulpit straight. That's straight. (laughs) So this little tool has been used, it's an ancient tool, it's been used to line up brick walls, to start straight foundations of buildings. It it was even used in the lining up of the large stones of the Great Pyramids, and medically, even today, the plumb line helps detect scoliosis of the spine. How is your spiritual backbone? Are you, are we, in alignment with the purposes of God? Or do we suffer from a type of spiritual scoliosis? Sometimes we all become uncentered or we become overwhelmed from cluttered lives with all its obstacles to God. And after a while, we can become hardened. So we blame God, we blame others, we forget to be kind to ourselves, and we close ourselves off for protection and into a hard shell. And it takes the word of God to pierce through the husk of our prideful attitudes and the whole of our defensive rationalizations. Enter the good news. (laughs) We need to remember that we're part of the communion of saints, right? That we're part of God's good creation and the true story of redemption. We are all about being a new creation in Jesus Christ, and not for solace only, but for strength. Therefore, as Christians, we mature in faith in order to pay it forward, to disciple others into and through their life of faith. We partner with God to build up the kingdom of God, person by person, soul by soul, and day by day. A plumb line is for the purpose of a solid, strong, and sustainable building. Unfortunately, we've all seen in the news from Surfside what shoddy construction and deferred maintenance can lead to. But a plumb line is how you and I begin to build in a way that is solid and strong. And we can build upwards in our relationship to God and to ourselves 
knowing it is God that sustains us. We are not alone, and we can build upwards in our friendships, in our families, in our workplaces, our schools, and last but not least, guess what? Our church. The plumb line marks our vertical connection to God. And discipleship and outreach, the crossbeam, connecting us as a koinonia, a community of faith. Then the vertical and the horizontal together, a cross. And on that cross, on that cross, they pierced his side with a spear. But he pierced the tough husk of this old world by his resurrection. So who is Jesus? He's the master carpenter who measures us and measures us with his grace. In order to build us up, to reveal to us day by day how to love God, the loving Father, Abba Father, and how to love one another. Thanks be to God. Amen.